Welcome back. And it's a real honour to introduce the next session, Professor Sarah Dillon leading the conversation with Jeanette Winterson. Sarah is Professor of Literature and the Public Humanities at the University of Cambridge and is also an author and broadcaster on BBC Radio 3 and 4. Her most recent book is Story Listening, Narrative Evidence and Public Reasoning, which makes the case for taking stories seriously to improve public reasoning. So without further ado, let me hand over to Sarah to formally introduce the one and only Jeanette Winterson. Over to you, Sarah. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, I've been given, I should say at the start, an iPad that times out. So if you find me prodding <laughs> at my screen, it's because it yeah, is Yeah, well, we're in a tech conference, aren't we? <laughs> there we so go. Naturally, you know. <laughs> so I'm going to start with a little quote. Um, humans are not nature nurture. Humans are narrative. The stories we hear, the stories we tell, the stories we must learn to tell differently. Humans have been telling stories since time began, on cave walls, in song, in dance, in language. We make ourselves up as we go along. Who we are is not a law. We're not like gravity. We are an ongoing story. And those words were written, of course, by my wonderful guest today, uh, the author of many, many, many stories, acclaimed writer and storyteller, Jeanette Winterson. Welcome, Jeanette. It's an absolute pleasure to have you oh, here. Oh, thank you, Sarah. It's great to be talking to you today. And I'm delighted to be here. It's exciting to yeah. be in person. Yeah, well, and I feel like I've been going. smuggled in. Kind of, oh, this is that writer, but we've let her in. That's really great. <laughs> um, well, just uh, for the audience at home, uh, Jeanette and I are going to talk until about um, 12.40, and then we should have um, a good amount of time for some questions from the audience before we wrap up about 5 to 1. Um, if you're on your computer screens, you should see Slido in your right-hand toolbar, I am told, uh, where you can submit your questions. Don't put them in the chat, uh, because I can't see that. Um, so uh, get your thinking caps on for things you would like to ask Jeanette towards the end. Um, but to start off, Jeanette, you've written uh, many novels, novellas, short stories, a comic book, um, but you've also written three collections of non-fiction essays, and the most recent, which is why we're here today, and uh, the book is up at the back there, is 12 Bites, How We Got Here, Where We Might Go Next. Mm. And I wondered, given that quite a lot of the ideas in the essay collection are also in your uh, 2019 novel, Frankenstein, mm. why did you decide to write a collection of non-fiction essays? No, it's a good question. I was trying to learn something for myself, which is usually how I proceed, um, because I'm curious and... As you, as you know, with, with Frankenstein, the novel, I've been following developments in AI for a long time, it just, just for my own interest, not for any other reason. And at the end of that novel, I thought, I need to go further. I've got questions I'm still asking myself, and so I'm going to answer them by creating a series of essays, initially just for me. And I wanted to go back to the Industrial Revolution, you know, where, where really this, this, this moment begins. It's where the art starts. It's where we, we first hear the word acceleration. And as machines begin to accelerate human capacity, but also cause the horrors of the factory system, which made so many people so desperately miserable. Life expectancy in my hometown of Manchester was 30 years old. So I thought, I'll go back to where I was born. I'll go back to where this all begins. It's the moment when fossil fuels come out of the ground for the first time in planet-changing quantities. And this will allow me to move forward until we get to the computing revolution. Uh, and then I'll be in, begin to understand that as well. And I thought, if people can see an art, of 250 years of how from the moment when we actually intervene in our human evolution which is what the industrial revolution is we're not waiting for mother nature anymore we're getting in there and we're changing things then we can see that trajectory historically see our place there and see where we are now uh, and that's because I'm wondering whether this is a cusp moment, whether this is the point where Homo sapiens, which has only, you know, only been around 300,000 years, it's just this tiny salami slice of space time, is this a moment in our evolution where we do have to fully take control, where we use the intelligence that we're creating? And I don't think of it as artificial intelligence. It is at the moment because it's just a tool, but it could be alternative intelligence. We could take this further. And I'm excited by that because I'm wondering, will we look back? And will we think, yes, 
this now all makes sense in terms of time. This is, this is where we intervened further, um, both in our biological identity, whether we live longer, whether, whether we align ourselves with the technology we're creating, as Elon Musk thinks we should, um, so that we're part of the hive mind. You know, the, you know all these things that are going forward now. And indeed, whether we begin to give up uh, our biological identity completely so that we're no longer a substrate made of meat, that there are other possibilities. Um, it might be so, and these things are worth thinking about, but they're only worth thinking about if we ground them concretely in where we've come from, you know, so that we get a sense of the whole. What I never like as a writer is to be isolated on a little raft of time, bobbing about, not understanding what came before, not understanding where I am in history. Um, you know, that's the job of the humanities, to look at history so that we can learn from it, understand from it, and use it right across every sphere, whether it's science and technology, you know, whatever it is, the sociology, the way we live, and think, what can we learn? What lessons are there? Um, and what, whatever the lessons are there, we know that technology has to benefit the many and not the few, and it did not when we first started to invent it. And we also know that there has to be a wider discourse, a, a getting away from elites and hierarchies into something that is much more democratic, something that's more communal, something that's more inclusive, something that is not not about us and them, because also, if we do create this technology that we might be creating now, which is smarter than us, in the us and them stakes, we're going to be the them. And that is not a story I want to tell. You know, when Homo sapiens gets knocked off the top of the tree, it's the smartest thing on the planet. And we have done a fucking terrible job of it, actually, boys and girls. You know, I think we deserve to go. It's like, bye-bye. Um, that's why I hope this is an evolutionary moment. But if we find that we are in that position. We don't want the us and them story, the old binary, the old hierarchy, the way we've constructed societies up till now. We have to catch up with our cleverness. It's so important that we do. You've pretty much covered everything I wanted okay, to ask right, about in then. one answer, so should we just finish now? <laughs> we'll go uh, I'm going right to dig down, on, can some, dig on, down. on some of those. But that's why. <laughs> All those questions were sort of teeming around in my head, and because I come from a very religious background, I was brought up in a cult, I was fascinated by the, sort of the language of the geeks, you know, the rapture of the geeks. It's just exactly what we had at home. Uh, you're not tied to your body, the end is nigh, there's somewhere better to go, you know, there's more to this, we always knew it. And I thought, how come science and religion are now saying the same thing, I can't believe this. Um, so I had a Mrs. Winterson moment and thought, well, maybe this is end time because either we destroy ourselves completely, which is the way that you know, Botox Bond villain Putin is moving around at the moment might happen, um, or we are actually able to make the leap and move forward. So that, that, that was it. That's why I did it. And has it been received? Well, in different ways. Um, what, what I thought has been so lovely is that uh, the science communities have accepted this book and wanted to talk to me, you know, whatever it is, um, whether it's been Wired, whether it's been the, the, you know, the Turing Institute, New Scientists, there's been a, a real sense of, good, let's connect across the divide, and that's what you want. Um, it's the joined up thinking that humanity needs now, not the separate silos of expertise. Those things really matter. I'm not a Michael Gove that we've had it with experts. We so haven't. We need people who can do this stuff. But we also need these conversations across disciplines um, because that's also where ideas come from. Mm. Um, some people in the humanities thought, what's she talking about that for? Um, a, because she can't possibly know anything about it, and B, it's not her special subject, so maybe she should just shut up. But I'm not going to shut up, am I? What, what I wanted to do was to th find perhaps readers like me who were reasonably intelligent, curious persons who were not tech specialists, not, not maths heads, um, not geeky guys and gals, but who wondered what was going on mm. and how they could be better informed and therefore part of the conversation um, and, and feel less shut out. You know, you don't want it to be like a priestly hierarchy of only people who've done a maths degree or a computing science degree can talk about this. That's, that cannot be the case. It's one of the reasons Stephanie Shirley, you know, we heard earlier, is so fabulous because whatever she is, you know, entrepreneur she's a communicator um, trying to get the story across and mm. that's you know where we came in with your first question these are stories that need to be told because they affect all of our lives it's not just about data sets and algorithms I mean look we're all raised on data sets you me um, the data set of our family our background our education our environment those are data sets 
But the thing with humans is that we can always interfere with our own data sets. And that's how minds are changed, because you suddenly get information that is unexpected. um, And that allows you to think differently. So if we're creating machine intelligence, which is going to do more in our world, yes, we've got to manage the data sets. But we've also got to understand in there um, our own biases. And I'm hoping this is like a reflective mirror. When we look at what we do, the way we think unconsciously about one another, and we start shoveling this stuff into the machine, we've now seen that we, have a, we are actually always operating on unconscious bias. And a lot of the stories that we've told are incomplete, you know, they're unpleasant, they can only lead to trouble, they need revising urgently. And we've discovered this because of, already, our interaction with machine learning. Um, and to me, that's a huge plus and also so significant in that it's going to be, this, is, this will be a two-way street. We will learn from what we are creating as well as imagining that we're just programming this thing. So that, for me, it's such an exciting moment and also such a terrifying moment. Which way is it going to go, Sarah? Oh, I don't know. Maybe we should ask Damn. the audience. Maybe we'll ask them later. <laughs> well, actually, that, come, that comes on something I did want Apocalypse to ask you about. Apocalypse now? Well, or I, but it's the utopia. question of prediction, isn't it? And actually, yeah. that's what I wanted to ask you about, because, because you're, you know, you're foremost known as a, as a fictional storyteller, and part of this history that's informing where we are now is the historical fictional imaginings of machine intelligence and AI. And you, you mentioned throughout the books, you know, you allude to different sort of science fiction writers mm. or Ursula Le Guin's Ansible, which was a yeah, kind of 1966. 1966 you know, and it's got email, a black keyboard. email. Yeah, interplanetary yeah. email in 1966. Yeah. You know, and we had to of, wait a while for that. One of the, the kind of frustrating things I hear is, you know, science fiction is important because it predicts things. Mm. Um, but I don't think that's why it's important. I just wondered why, what role do you think this history of our story stories about AI are playing or could play now? You're exactly right in that it's things are propositional. We make these stories up as we go along. And that's why fate's not fixed. It's why the future can't be predicted in some crystal ball way. And human beings, we've always managed to get ourselves out of trouble at the last minute and carry on. You know, we are, we are the survivor species, but obviously I'm also worried that we are the suicide species because since technology has, has really come to the forefront of how we do everything, we've just found so many ingenious ways to murder each other and wreck the planet, deceive, steal, murder and wreck. And that's the chimp part of us, isn't it? I mean, because we don't live like bonobos who are kind of non-hierarchical and the females sort it all out. It's nice and gentle. We live like chimps and it's all, no, this is my territory and I'm going to eat all the bananas and bash you over the head. And once you've got the technology as well behind that, it's a really bad story. And that's what I mean about us catching up with our emotional intelligence, uh, some wisdom. Um, You know, one of the issues is that... uh, for many people, uh, th- there is this, this idea that whatever human beings do is okay. We don't need to have any responsibility to the, the creatures we share the planet with or the planet itself. And that has only just started to change in mass consciousness so recently. But if that story is changing, then we do get a chance, don't we, um, to stabilise the moment that we're in, not, not find that we're fighting over every last resource and the last thing anyone will be interested in is de- developing technology further because we'll just be struggling to stay alive. And that's what I mean about the pivotal moment. And you know at the end of um, Origin of Species, 1859, where Charles Darwin, it's such a beautiful end and it's so not about survival it's of the, the fittest. The garden. Yes, he's walking from, on the riverbank, yeah. isn't he? And he sees out all of nature, including himself, um, as a participant, you know, which is way before quantum mechanics said you can't separate the observer and the observed. He realises that he too, the great scientist, is part of this web of life and that it's all interdependent. It is the most beautiful ending, and so overlooked when people talk about his book. And I think that was a real insight moment uh, in the mid-19th century about how things could go. You know, we've already got the railways, we've already got the factory system. Um, It's it's one of the high points of, of, of technological development at that time, but he sees something else. He sees the web of life. Um, and that story is one that we should be telling. And it's interested me, you know, because I read that book a long, long time ago when I was a child, actually, because I like biology. But in those days, you had to choose what you did. <laughs> you couldn't pick and mix. You either had to be in the humanities or the sciences. So that all went out the window. But I was reading it and thinking about it again and thinking, why, when with a book like that, would you privilege survival of the fittest, which is not about let me bash you over the head and eat all the bananas. Um, Instead of thinking, no, this is a story about the web of life and how we have managed to be at the apex of creation. But what what does that bring in terms of responsibility 
I think it, it's huge. And it's that responsibility, you know, that, that we, we are putting aside continually and saying, no, it's someone else's problem. Well, who else's problem? <laughs> you know, if you're going to be king of the world, then it's your problem. Yeah. Um, you asked me if I know what's going to happen in the future. I don't. Uh, but I do wonder if our audience knows what's happened in the past. Um, and you've just talked about how important uh, a historical understanding was for yourself to, to understand our current yeah. moment. So we're going to have a polling question for Oi. our online audience if this works. Oh, Let's try it. Um, so we're going to have polling question one, uh, which should, I am told, be appearing somewhere on your screens as we speak. Um, which computing pioneer built a three billion uh, dollar tech empire starting in the 1960s. Um, a, and you're not allowed to say the answer out loud, okay? A, Steve Shirley, B, Steve Jobs, C, Steve Vickers, or D, Steve Wozniak. So, if you want to join in, please do. They um, knew that one. I, well, this is what's fascinating. Uh, so, how many answers do so I know? We've got two people in. who've answered, is that right? Four, it's going up, it's going up. Um, We've not got... Come and play more. Click on something. There we go. There we go. Uh, Don't we Google it. Answers. Oh, yeah, I hadn't thought to tell oh, them that. They're no techies, Googling. aren't they? They're all going to be out. No it's all Googling. too late. They've just put it in. Oh, it's still going. Do you want to have a look? It's, it's the high sort of, It's interesting. Sort of oh, neck and neck. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. fascinating. So I think, are we going to... We might leave it there. We'll leave it know. there. We'll we're, leave it there. We're pausing it. So we've got, we've got about 26 answers. So um, I think you can see your results on your screen for um, Jeanette and Khan. It's Steve Shirley at 35%, Steve Jobs at 27%, Steve Vickers at 15%, Steve Wozniak at 23%. So the hive mind gets it right. I think there was a distinct advantage by the fact that she actually was on the session before us, which oh, was she's just so not great. planned in I just, any I way. I love that woman. I mean, for <laughs> what she's done in this world. And, you know, when I was, what, when, when I was researching this, I mean, first of all, Going in, in the history of it, I realised, A, how important in Mary Shelley had been. That 19-year-old girl had a vision of the future. And we're the first generation who can read it right. Um, not because we're creating an alternative intelligence out of the discarded body parts of the graveyard, but out of the zeros and ones of code. And she knew that fundamental to this new life form would be electricity. Now, it didn't exist when no. she was writing this, starting in 1816. It was so not understood as a force, and only, only in vague use, you know, um, 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 Monsieur Volta had made the battery, you know, and Galvani was sticking his probes into frogs. I love that with our galvanizers and our vaults. But and she'd seen that, uh, and they'd, she'd seen a, course, a corpse at Newgate Prison leap into life when they stuck their little prods in. But it wasn't understood. And I thought this woman put a message in a bottle two hundred years ago. She is the beginning, just as the Industrial Revolution is the beginning. And as you know, on that holiday on Lake Geneva, when she was writing Frankenstein at the, at the behest of Lord Byron, Byron had just had a baby daughter. He never saw her. He'd wanted a boy. He was deeply disappointed. And that baby daughter, of course became Ada, Countess of Lovelace, mm -hmm. um, the person who programmed the thing that had never been built by Charles Babbage. Um, so we're there, at, you know, there's two women right at the beginning. And then I was researching how women were so excited by computing science and were doing it, 37% computing science majors in the United States until 1984 and the Apple home computer comes along. And it's like, get out of the way, girls. This is for the boys to play on after work, after school. And women suddenly began to be sidelined, marginalized. They were laughed at and classes, they didn't have the home time on these new computers, and so they were behind when they got into formal computing education. I did not know that story, um, and I'm a pretty aware person, and I'm a feminist, mm. and I've just been so angry at the garbage being kicked out by men all over the place, saying, oh, if women wanted to do this, they would do it. There's nothing in their way. And, you know, we were talking about my godkids, who were both they're both science heads, but one has gone in, into the humanities because she just said, it's more interesting. I don't want to sit there with all these smelly guys in front of a screen. Um, I can go and do something else, so I am. Um, and, you know, these, it's a real pity. And you said you, that you did, you did maths. Yeah. And you decided because you were also good at other things, you could go and do other things. Yeah. And we hear this over and over and again with girls. Uh, and I see it at the University of Manchester um, where I do some courses part part of the year. Um, clever, sciencey, computer-interested, code-literate girls don't like the look of the world. 
And so they go to the world of that, that world. And so they go and do something else. And we've really got to manage that. And guys have got to manage it as well and just stop saying, oh, well, if you wanted to, you could. This does really have to be a, a non-gendered effort um, because women do make up slightly more than half of the people on this planet. And we need them in the zone. You know, they are not an afterthought. How, how, well, there you go. You asked me a hard question. I'm yeah. ask you one. How do, we, how do we change it? Do we need to tell different stories? Who tells totally. stories? Totally. Yeah, that's exactly right. First, these stories need to get out there more. I mean, why? Um, when there was all that fuss about Google, um, saying, oh, you know, about 20% women is right. Why was somebody not challenging that and saying, that is ahistorical, it's not true, what you're talking about is complete and utter bollocks, so can you tell the truth and then just separate that from your prejudices and mm. your biases? So it's getting the right stories across to girls when they're doing maths and computing, saying, hey, did you know, right from the get-go in school, did you know that loads of women used to do this? Did you know that at the beginning there was Ada Lovelace, there was Mary Shelley, did you know these stories? And telling them about Stephanie Shirley, so girls suddenly see themselves, you know, what you can't see, you can't be. And they see themselves, they see themselves in history, in the past as well as in the present. And then they get excited and empowered because boys have loads of role models. They can look at anything they want to do and they can see people have done it and done it well, not so for girls, because that history is distorted. And that's what really annoys me, um, that they don't know it and it's deliberately covered up, distorted, lost. And I want to see that change. And if we got there in schools early and we were telling these amazing stories about women who'd succeeded, uh, doing maths, doing coding, saying, this is really fun, you're going to enjoy it, I think we'd, we'd see a difference so quickly. And then, and only then, would it cut through to university level, which is where we need it. Yeah. There was a, a UK report on how to get more girls into STEM a few years back, and there was yeah. nothing in it on stories. There was nothing in it not. on... You know, it was all about other kinds of incentives or mobilisation so I think that's a bit of the puzzle that isn't isn't there yet isn't yeah it? yeah yeah so I would really I think we could do a lot um, it's just educating the teachers and I think a lot of the teachers themselves are, sort of don't know these stories uh, a lot of the women who teach math science computing the ones who do are demoralized by the situation so we do need to get in there and help and it's not about a lot of money it's about changing the mindset it's the data set isn't it yeah. can you give these kids the right data set please and then it won't be garbage in garbage out I love that you think stories are data and of course they are stories. of course it is great. what else is it that's yeah. what it is uh, it's just in a different form um, and we we have to recognize that that's why the, for me, the idea of artificial intelligence, I know as John McCarthy came up with that term in the 50s, I don't, uh, to, as opposed to natural intelligence that we share with, with other creatures on the planet, it's not right. I would prefer if we could start thinking about it as an alternative, an alternative intelligence, not artificial. It's not a helpful word, mm. um, and it's not an accurate word. And, you know, and I'm a language monger, so I like things to be accurate. But also, if we could see intelligence, again, not have contempt for intelligences that are not ours, you know, we're beginning to understand that with people with differences, high-functioning autism, people who just, we just thought were odd or weird, we recognise that there are different kinds of human intelligence, and we're recognising that there is animal intelligence. They're not dumb and stupid. We know that the whole thing is that web of life which operates on its own intelligences. So to me, the idea of, of machine intelligence, something that is not a substrate made of meat, and that doesn't perhaps have consciousness or won't have in the way that we do, but will have agency, reflection, capacity, as well as decision making. Why would that not be possible? Uh, for me, in the story, uh, it, it sounds very likely and should be the next, the next step forward for us. You know, I think we will blend with our technology. I think we'll have to. And after that, do we, do we make something else, uh, deliberately create something else? You know, I'm interested in all the creation stories of the world um, because they usually involve a god figure uh, getting something messy like clay or some other material which is inert and then breathing into it and then that becomes a, a creature which becomes a human creature and then goes forward. Um, we know that's not how things are created but we should look at the stories because what they're really saying, they're about substrates and they're really saying the substrate doesn't matter that much. What matters is the, the infilling. What matters is, is what religions call the God-given consciousness or the spirit of it. But what we're really saying is you can make this out of anything. You know, um, make it out of a bit of tin if you want, a bit of metal, you know, do what you like, silicon, flesh. Um, but then it will deliver in a different way. You can, it doesn't mean that it's not intelligent or can't be. 
You're, you're in the writing very interested in sort of transhumanism and posthumanism. Would you, if you had the opportunity, would you upload your mind? Sure. What, what would you miss, do you think? Eating. <laughs> <laughs> that's like in the Matrix, that's the thing they miss. Isn't yeah, it? yeah, yeah. And yeah. you would. Look, you, I think you may be able to take sort of holidays in biological bodies. It'd be like going to a 1950s holiday camp if you went back in your body and thinking, oh God, look, we can eat chips and just get drunk all night. And then you'd be so sick that you're saying, quick, upload me again. I can't stand it. I feel ill. Um, so there might be ways around this. Um, but I see no reason why not. I really don't. I mean, and again, it's the idea of immortality that you know, religions have always said the soul will leave the body because this is provisional, it's a construct, and we'll go and do something else. That's really the same thing as saying, yes, we'll learn how to upload our consciousness, and then we will not... Materiality and consciousness won't be are not the same thing. We've, ne we've always said they're not the same thing, and I, have, I can't see any reason why consciousness should be obliged to materiality and possibly it won't be and you know there's still a good percentage of people on this planet a lot of people on this planet whose main relationship is with a non-biological entity i.e god who has never had a biology except possibly in the christian tradition for very few years but who is essentially not made of meat mm -hmm. you know and neither are angels and neither are leprechauns and neither are pixies and neither is all the other stuff that people have thought that they lived with for so long and that is an imaginative clue um, we do not feel that this is all there is and we do not feel that this is all they need be and if you imagine that sky gods are never biological entities and lots of people talk to them every day pray to them when the dead go we still think we can talk to our dead even when we don't really believe we can we 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 are absolutely sure in our deepest psychic ranges that biology is not the last word to this story and given that this form of Homo sapiens has only been around for 300,000 years, and we know there were previous forms, and that's becoming clear. It's not just the Neanderthals. We know that there's been things on the way through. Why would this be the end? Why would this be the end of the story? That's not how stories end. You're so certain. I found that, like, <laughs> I just have totally the opposite view. Like, I absolutely feel that we're fundamentally embodied, and that is essential to who we are, but we're, we using, are at the minute. we're using we quite freely here, and we've got, know, and we've got an know. audience. So well, you can, I have, I, I'm 50-50 <laughs> on this, and do you know what? I don't mind. Um, I don't mind if I'm right, don't mind if I'm wrong. That isn't what interests me, being right or wrong. What interests me is just thinking about it, yeah. and, and thinking about it using time, using stories, using history, um, not just using the present moment. Well, I've got another question. I don't have the, you know, will we be able to upload question, <laughs> but I've got a close one, which is, um, will AGI, so Advanced General Intelligence, exist by 2072? And I chose that because there's a, a line... <laughs> it's really, but really it's very random precise. Bit of date, isn't it's it? It's very <laughs> precise, because you talk in the book about um, the, how much has changed in the past 50 years. So okay. I added 50 years okay. to now. So, okay. Fair so, so that's your question on your screens now. Okay. Uh, will AGI exist by 2072? And I'm told that my yes or no answer has been slightly softened with a I'm not sure answer, which I think, to be honest, is a bit of a cop out. So do I. So I, I think you need to Come click on, on the yes or, or no. Binary so let's see. Oh, we're 50 50. Whoa. Oh, now, see, I knew too many people would say not sure. There we go. It's coming. It's coming <laughs> up and down. Yes, is you know you've you've got you with kindred spirits. Oh, oh well, no, we're neck and oh, neck oh, again oh, now. Oh, 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 now on. knows, now knows Vote going for further. Me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like some terrible game show, isn't it? it? Is. <laughs> How we're, what we're up to. Oh, well, more people were interested in answering this question uh -huh. than, than proving that they didn't know about Steve Shirley. Um, we're, there, we're up at like 45 now. And we are literally neck and neck. It's like 41%, 41% with a few not sure. It's moot, isn't it? So it's clearly an, un, an undecided point. Well, look, of course it is. Because whatever we've seen over the last 20 years, it's big, everything has become... I mean, I, when I went into the millennium, I thought, this is great. We're really making progress across the world. It was looking good, wasn't it? 2000 was looking good. And things since then have become both really unpredictable, really frightening. Um, it does feel like last chance saloon. I'm, and I'm, I'm an optimist and I'm looking and thinking, watching the wheels come off, thinking we don't have a lot of time to sort this out. So I think if we, if we get through this point, then it would, this, this, this bit of history, um, the world does stabilise again and we manage to stabilise the planet. Then we could put our best efforts into thinking, well, do we want to try to develop um, AGI? 
do we want to try and develop what, what could be um, a separately functioning different kind of intelligence that would work alongside us? Um, and if we do, then again, that, can't be, that, that should not be done by a private company here, um, an authoritarian government there. That's the fear. This is the point where it should become a, a project that, that we, maybe like the Manhattan Project, you know, where we're, that there are many companies, governments, interested parties involved together for the common wheel, not for competition, mm -hmm. but to think this is where we have to go forward uh, as a people. Um, and it doesn't look like that with nationalism and authoritarianism and dictatorships and not jobs everywhere thinking that they're in charge. But I do think it will have to it would have to be much more of a collective, a collaborative effort. Um, you know, one of the many lessons that we see from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is that Victor Frankenstein, the scientist, uh, insists on operating alone. Um, he doesn't want to share his knowledge. It, it becomes... It's, it's not, it, even though he starts off as a collaborative scientist and medical doctor, it, this, this becomes his, his dark and dirty secret, and it becomes between him and the thing that he's created. And there's a warning in there um, that that is not how it should go. Um, it's, you know, it's something she was writing because you know, it's around the time we've just had the French Revolution, we've just, um, 1789, we've just had the American Declaration of Independence, 1776, uh, her mother's Mary Wollstonecraft, you know, one of the first feminists. But out of that period was coming the idea that there, there had to be this sense of, of, of equality and, hum and in unity among mankind. That comes out of the Enlightenment project. Yes, the individual's important, but also, what about all of us, not just some of us? So I think Mary Shelley acutely understood that. She was a political mm. animal. And we often forget when we read it that the politics in that book are very important, just, but they are understated. You know, the monster, of course, is not educated. Again, how do you educate your AI? Not even named. If you do this as an us and them thing, then you're going to have a situation where we're not making a new kind of extended family. Um, we're making something which, yes, will be baleful um, and possibly set against us in Terminator-style dystopian scenarios. We've all seen all the movies. But no story has to go that way. It doesn't have to go down the gloomy old you know, Elon Musk route. Um, it can go down a route which really could benefit us all if we tell it right. We, we've been talking a lot about the kind of more speculative ends of, of AI, yeah. kind of transhumanism yeah. and AGI and uh, immort you know, machine-aided immortality. Um, a lot of money going do, into that, isn't yeah, there? Yeah, yeah. But do you, do you think that talking about those kinds of things is a, is a kind of unhelpful distraction from thinking about the way in which current automated decision-making systems, if yeah. we want to give them a much more <coughs> unexciting name, mm. are involved in things like exploitation, extraction, uh, surveillance, violation, uh, all of that. All Is of there, that. There's a risk in talking about the kind of fun stuff mm. that we are neglecting mm. that. Um, and you, there's one moment where you talk, um, and I think it's in Frankenstein, it, it may be in one or the other, uh, where you talk about Luddism and the Luddites being not opposed to machinery but being opposed to exploitation. Mm. And I wondered whether you thought we need a new Luddism, a kind of neo-Luddism now? Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's a good point because you know, it, it's out of the, the, the hatefulness of the factory system that so many of the rights that we thought we could take for granted, we can't now because they're being undercut, um, really came about because you know, it's Marx and Engels, isn't it, wandering around Manchester and, and Marx writes the Communist Manifesto in 1848 and you can't bloody blame him when he looks at the mess there. They called it the golden sewer. So much money, so much misery. And Engels looks and he says, this is what happens when men regard each other only as useful objects. Now, one of the problems uh, with automated systems is we're getting to a point where this is what happens when men regard each other only as useless objects. We don't need people anymore. We'll automate everything. We don't need people to do those low-grade jobs. We'll outsource that. You can do it yourself at the till, at the checkout, all of that, everything that we've seen uh, where humans are, are gradually being removed um, from ord ordinary situations in life. Well, actually, most of us would like humans, not even the people doing the jobs who won't have any jobs. You know, that, I mean, that tsunami is yet to come as this automates up the food chain and your dentist is suddenly an arm <laughs> coming out to manage your teeth. We know what's happening. We can see it. And this is why the question of how do we want this to go is so important. And yes, we cannot put aside all those things about... The, you know, we know that... Um, 
Amazon has got the sort of biggest surveillance system in the world, and it's that, it's that doorbell that can see you as you go up and ring on it, sees everything about your property. We know that the idea of a smart house is really exporting all your data to interested parties who will then sell it on and then try and sell you stuff. So all of these things are there. But the technology is it's in itself, it's not evil. It's all we're the problem. Mm. And so it's that sense of being reflected back on us. How are we going to use these awesome things that we are creating, that we have created? And that debate, yes, must not be swept aside. It has to be at the forefront. We have to be at the forefront of how are we dealing with what we've got now? And is it ruining people's lives or is it enabling people's lives? Obviously, it's, it's mixed, it's both, but we know the direction of travel we'd like it to go in. But at the same time, we need to look forward, too, into something that, that could be utopian. You know, it doesn't all have to end up as a dystopia, but it will if we're not careful. Because, you know, those of you who ride motorbikes, um, you know that you know, where your head goes, your ass follows. Um, if you look the wrong way, you come off. And it's the same for us. We have to have a vision which is not doom-filled and apocalyptic in order to feel that we are worth going forward. That vision was there in the Enlightenment, the idea of the perfectibility mm. of humankind. And that vision has been tragically destroyed from the Industrial Revolution onwards. And we've seen the horrors that we were able to unleash on one another, um, both in the small domestic scale of, of something like the factory system and into the, the, the weaponry and warfare that we've been able to unleash. You know, once we dropped those bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we didn't need a vengeful god or a planetary crisis to destroy us. We knew that we could do it ourselves. That's what I mean about the suicide species. Um, we have to get rid of what Freud called the death wish. Uh, it's really important. And it may be just that we can't bear how smart we are. Maybe the, the idea of living on will be so awful for us because then we would have to take responsibility. But that might be a good thing. If we all knew we were going to be around for 150 years, maybe you'd clean up your bedroom and wash up a bit more. <laughs> yes, yes, you know, it's that version of it. You're not, you, know, you can't just... We all wait for old white guys to die when they're just driving us mad. But on the other hand, if we're sticking around and we've got a bigger stake in the planet, uh, maybe we do take longer views... Yeah. longer term views, not just the short termism that we, we have seen has so distorted the way that we live, particularly since the mid 80s uh, with financial markets, business markets you know, Stephanie Shelley was saying, wasn't she that there are many bottom lines, it's not just about profit, where do you put the people in that and that's what we're asking with AI now, both narrow goal tool AI and something that we might develop later, where are the people what are we doing, are we, are we keeping people are, are, we, are we enhancing people are we uploading people What's going to happen? So there's that view, and there's the one here and now. That we have to manage what we've got and do it a bit better. So it's both and. We, we, we do both. I think so, because you know I don't like the binaries. Yeah. I, think, I think they're distorting, and, and they, they are the true artificials. It's not an either or, or this or that, a black and white, and us and them. Um, it can't be. Because that's 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 such a provisional way of looking at how things really work. Yeah, um, oh, I want to open out to the audience in a minute, but uh, I've got one um, final question to ask you, Jeanette, and to ask them. Um, and we've sort of mentioned it in that just that last few minutes, which is our attitude towards the future, I guess, and not our cognitive attitude, but our emotional mm. and affective attitude. Mm. And there's a line towards the end of your novel Frankenstein that really struck me because. It's uh, floating by itself after a very harrowing description of an attempted rape and an assault on the trans character, and before we go into Mary Shelley's mind having lost the third of her babies. And it's a line that it says, hope is a duty, hope is our reality. And there's so many people that I talk to and work with now that that feel that hope is almost a dirty word, like with, with big tech, with authoritarian governance, with war, with the climate crisis, that actually to be hopeful is in some way politically irresponsible. So I, I wondered why, sort of in the face of collective or personal trauma, why should we continue to hope? Because it is a duty. And for me, both words are very precise and specific. Duties are generally things that you find difficult and sometimes you would rather not do, but you do it um, for something larger than yourself, looking outside of your own situation. And optimism 
shouldn't be the same as magical thinking. They're not the same. Again, words have to mean what they mean. They have to be precise. So we don't want magical thinking. We don't want, oh, it'll all be all right on the night, or somebody else will sort that out. That's no good. That's, that's, that is passivity. Hope is not passive. Hope means that you will get involved, that you will try to bring about the reality that you would wish for, um, that you think is possible with the effort. Um, f for me... Um, Hope is really, it, it's, it, it's the triumph of imagination, um, not over reality, but over despair. Because once you start to despair, you really feel that you can't do anything. You think, poor me, little me, I, I have no influence. It's all now too big, it's too beyond me. I don't understand it. Um, I'll just close the door and, 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 ho and hope in the wrong way that it will all go away. It won't go away. It's never going to go away. And so that's why I urge people of all kinds, shapes, sizes, across class, position, whatever you are, to get involved in your world, um, to make decisions from the very small decisions, you know, which look small, to the food on your plate, um, to the bigger decisions about how we lobby um, for companies to be responsible, for the kind of research we'd like to see money put into, um, for the kind of life we'd like to see people being able to lead. You know, most people on this planet want things which are quite modest. Um, they don't want to be entrepreneurs, they don't, entrepreneurs, they don't want to be masters of their fate uh, and this went a world king way what they'd like is a decent place to live clean water clean food clean air um, a job that doesn't kill them at the end of the day and that brings in enough money to live a decent life and raise their kids and to let those kids be educated and have a future that was perhaps better than theirs that's what parents want for their children. These are, these are such modest aims. They are such simple things. People are not looking um, for yachts and Ferraris. Um, they ought to go gambling every Friday night and have tons of money to spend. They're not. Um, and it seems so terrible that at this point where we are, with everything that we've developed, everything that we know, that we cannot offer those, those simple things. It's what Marx does talk about in the Communist Manifesto. And he says, look, socialism's there um, uh, to manage man's animal needs, by which he meant the food, the shelter, all that. And then man can get on with doing his human needs. Then we can look for the stars. Then we have the leisure to think, to plan, to devise, to enjoy, um, to imagine differently. Because we're not crushed down and bowed down all the time, thinking, am I going to lose my job? What's going to happen to my kids? I can't afford anywhere to live. I can't even afford the bus. We are in 2022. And across the world, most people are thinking like that. They don't have enough, and they can't see that enough's coming. You know, I was looking at, uh, at Manchester, University of Manchester. We did a big project about who voted. Brexit. And it wasn't just people who had lost everything in the poor parts of the country, you know, with the kind of common wisdom about the Red Wall. It was more specific. It was people who had no hope, mm. people who did not believe that things would ever change for themselves or, crucially, for their children. And, you know, and the immigrant, immigrant dream is, I will work my ass off, it doesn't matter, but my kids, they'll have a life. And if a parent can't feel that, they are crushed. So hope, I think, means that you're going to have to get out and fight back with the last bit of energy you've got from putting food on the table, or if you're lucky enough to be secure, as we are, then certainly hope is a duty. And the duty that comes with it is to be an activist in your life, in the small and in the big, um, to refuse these uh, uh, apocalyptic doom stories. And this is the way it is. This is the reality. We can't change it. To refuse that and to say, we can and we will and we'll try. Brilliant. I realise I should have asked this last question of our audience at the beginning and at the end to see if the answer had changed, uh, but I wasn't that smart when I was prepping. So uh, we're going to ask it now before we then move into 10 minutes or so of questions. So your last polling question uh, coming up <laughs> on your screen is, do you have hope? And again, a I'm not sure was, me. was added, which I'm not too <laughs> happy about, but let's see uh, what answers have we got coming in. Have we got a hopeful audience, or at least a hopeful audience, after having listened to Jeanette for uh, 45 minutes. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, we do. Look, you, your mission has been accomplished. Hey! 76%, 79% of people are hopeful. Uh, it's going up all the time. In fact, that's the most decisive poll we have had. That's fantastic. So far. So yeah. there we well, go. Well, this was worth the trip then. <laughs> mission accomplished. <laughs> um, right, I am going to switch my tab over to audience Q&A. Um, oh, we've got lots of questions already, which is brilliant. Now, um, I was told to take the ones from the top because they're the ones that 
more people are interested in hearing you answer, oh. Jeanette. So here we go. Um, this is from Keith May. Thank you, Keith. Do you think there will be an AI that is able to actually learn from history or just doomed to relive it? Well, that's a very good point. It's a good question. Um, if, because as we know, AI can crunch so much data so quickly, um, if that AI was then able to have any re reflecting capacity to look at the history of Homo sapiens. I mean, can you imagine coming to look at us if you were another intelligence? Say you came in from planet Mars or wherever you came from, were you looking at us? You would be looking and thinking, oh no, um, they're not really going to do that next, are they? And then we go and do it. Um, and we don't learn from history um, at all. I think it was Bismarck, wasn't it, who said that the thing about history is that nobody learns from it. But we may be further down the line from that now because... We've seen enough since the Industrial Revolution to know that we, we, we can do things differently. We don't have to fall into the same traps. I mean, they were literally making up as they go along. I mean, one of the things about the factory system is that it wasn't necessarily intended to be cruel. It's just that when you come from a rural agrarian economy, you do work 12-hour days. Everybody on a farm works a 12-hour day, but it's not repetitive and you're not shut inside. So nobody thought, oh, these hours, you know, well, let's give them loads of hours. It was just the thing, the same. Um, but obviously it broke the spirit of so many people because humans hate repetition. And the point of machines is that they can do anything that's repetitive fast. So we should be using them, not to be make us all mind-numbingly bored, rigid out of out of ourselves. So I would like to think that yes, uh, working alongside machine intelligence, something yeah, Alan Turing thought was possible, that we could learn. And we're back to this business of we could learn together. We could learn from our own mistakes, and, and machine intelligence might be able to say. You've done this before, let's not do it again. We don't need to keep repeating ourselves. I mean, there's nothing worse, is there? So, I, I, you know, in my optimism, I'd like to think, yes, we could, and it, it, there is a way, and we're not doomed to keep repeating it. On the other hand, if this moment fails, and we go right back into space-time, and the planet blows up, or we, we just have to start this whole fucking thing again <laughs> and try to get to this point. You know, sometimes I think we probably have got to this point before, and we've messed it up so badly. You know, um, I think it was General McChrystal who said, look, I don't know what the Third World War, World, World War will be fought with, but the Fourth World War will be sticks and stones. Mm. If we mess this up, we're right back at the beginning. It's the snakes and ladder board, and we're at the bottom, which is why we can't mess it up. Great. I'm going to move us through because we've got lots of people wanting to ask you questions. Um, so uh, here's one from Hannah Clark. I'm worried about being a diversity hire after I graduated from my computer science MSc. How can I challenge companies to take me on for my skills and not my gender? I feel like uh, yeah. there's a bit of a sort of agony ant column going Oh, on yeah. And I mean, look, I can totally see that, Jeanette. can you? But... Um, I would say just get the job. Don't worry about it, no matter what. You know, even if they just think, God, she's so pretty, we'll hire her. Of course, it'll drive you mad. But once you're in there, there's nothing they can do. Because then you can start changing it from the inside, can't you? Never worry about why you've got the job, um, if you're a woman. Just get the job. Um, be confident. Go in there. Do it. Whatever you come from, whether, you know, whether you're a white woman, a black woman, whether you're a differently abled woman, whatever it is, Try and get the job, because the more women we get in there, um, the women like you can be the change that you want to see. So I would put that aside, not question yourself. God knows women are riven with doubt enough about why this, why that, why me. Um, forget that. Get in there and do it. And then support other women when you're in there, and then look at the system, and then you can start saying to your bosses, your colleagues, I think, I think we could just do this a bit differently. Yeah, and don't, I, I'm going to add a point here. Which Please. Is don't, don't take on the label that you think other people are giving to you. Because no. um, you've seen be, that yeah, from your own yeah, experience. Be, be yourself and do what you want to do. And, yeah. and don't what was it when you went to Cambridge? There were just nine men in the faculty. Nine male professors and no female professors in my faculty. And then you were just waiting for them to die. <laughs> and they did! <laughs> Die. They haven't died yet. Quite a few of them are retired. Oh my god! You, yeah, but immortality. Be careful what you wish for. I was just thinking, imagine all the people will be hanging around that we used to think, oh, it's all right. You know, the never, green room will take care of that. Never say anything to Jeanette in the green room that you don't want them discussed in public. Oh, a mental sorry. note. <laughs> right. 
great. <laughs> Moving on. Oh, look, um, death has some uh, advantages when it's not yours. <laughs> uh, we have a question from Amit Kumar. What are your thoughts on AI story generators? Oh, um, I, like, I, I think this is fun. I mean, I'm kind of with the musicians, the ones who think, you know, it, it's cool to work with um, AI systems. Um, you know, right back to David Cope, who programmed those, those Bart corrals and then went out for lunch and found he had 5,000 of them in an hour. Ah! And then everybody said, we can't play that because it's not real music. And he said, look, the question is um, not whether computers have a soul, but whether we do. Um, and for me, it's that open situation of anything that I can work with, I will work with. Um, it doesn't matter what the technology is. And I think you could have a lot of fun with these systems. If you're a creative person and you're confident, why wouldn't you want to work with the tech and see what it does to your own processes and what comes out of there? We're not slaves to it. Um, and if it doesn't work, we don't like it. We just say goodbye to that and carry on in the normal way. So I'm all for it. Uh, and I think, you know, we, we should have the enthusiasm for the things that we create and not think, oh, they're taking over. Um, you know, Picasso was so happy when photography came along because he thought, good, um, all those boring portrait painters, you know, who are just so bad at it, will now be out of a job because somebody will use a, <laughs> a camera. And I, this is Picasso speaking, won't have to do these boring lifelike portraits anymore. I can do these inner landscapes of the self, these, these, this, these psychological pictures of who we really are. And, of course, that's exactly what he did. Have you ever experimented with one, with a story generator? No, but that doesn't mean that I won't, yeah. because I played with Bot Poet, which I like a lot, uh, and I've done those things. You know, where you, the, there was a fantastic AI exhibition at the Barbican, you know, where you could put in random words and things would come out. I love that uh, because actually some of it that came out was strangely beautiful. Mm. You know, it was like an E. Cummings poem or a bit of Gertrude Stein or something. Um, but in the right circumstances, yes, I will be there. I've got a couple of projects that I want to finish. And then I'm thinking, I'm just going to open up my life to this entire tech business and see what happens. Oh, look out, Jeanette Winston's <laughs> coming. <laughs> um, uh, we've got time for a few more. Wonderful. Uh, this is from Evie Morton. Um, in what, oh, sorry, my screen just changed. There we go. In what ways do you think the non-binary movement will influence this industry which relies on the binary? Yeah. Well, the great thing about computing technology is that it uses binary, but it's not binary. And that is fab, because you know, we're too addicted to binaries, especially those of gender. And you know, certainly the idea that we might form relationships uh, with our technology interests me. You know, as said earlier, we do anyway. We have relationships with God. It may not even exist, probably, but he's certainly not a biological entity, and that's an important relationship. So that we can and we will, like the movie She... Um, I think will we'll dramatically change the, the rather narrow lexicon of our relationship awareness. It, it should make us bigger, better, stronger, not smaller and narrower. Um, it's again this, this question of reflecting back that we don't want to be stuck in binaries. You know? uh, and I think for trans people, you know, to me, they're often like the canaries in the coal mine. They're already seeing the way in which the body is a, is a flexible provisional space, which can change. And, of course, when this pushes further in, into the transhuman experiment, where we do merge with technology and later perhaps into the posthuman, this will all seem, I think, part of a continuum that does away with the ideas of binary. Um, you know, even in, if you think about Eastern thought, even things like good and evil, which in the West are like, he's the villain, he is the hero, he is the evil, he is the good. Um, in a Confucian system, it's, these are just forces that exist in a neutral way, rather like technology is neutral. And what matters is the balance, and that humans are always upsetting the balance. And that's what we've seen in our technological creations, isn't it? We can't balance anything um, because we're the suicide species. Anything that we can use for good, we manage to use to make a big mess for everybody. Um, we've got, I think, one more question. And I'm really pleased, actually, because someone has um, used a word that I wanted to ask oh. you about and didn't have time to in our discussion, um, which is a word that you have thought about and written about, I think, across all your work, if, at least in my reading of it, which is love. And we're at an AI tech conference. Uh, we're in a space with business people and academics and uh, civil servants. They must and, love somebody. Uh, but the word, there are certain words and certain uh, lexicons that, that can feel out of place in certain spaces. Mm. And I think, I wonder if love is a word that feels out of place here. So I wanted to ask you, and so does Kate Davis, um, she asked you what do you think futures of AI hold for love and intimacy, but maybe we could... Um, 
uh, open it up into the immortal line of what's love got to do with it? <laughs> <laughs> Everything. Love is never out of place. Um, love is the welcome guest at every situation. There is no place where love does not belong um, in our private lives or in, in, in the public sphere. Because, you know, we've got past now the sense that you can have the, your ob ob objective, rational, logical self. It was only some white guys you liked, but anyway. And then there's this other emotional self over here that has to be kept on a leash and is worrying and usually belongs to women or children and, and has to be kept in check and sometimes your heart can rule your head another bloody binary it's not that it's a joined up system you know we know cause, uh, that you can't have a thought without a feeling um we know that the limbic system takes precedence over the neural highway this is stuff we know and so we have to accept joyfully the scientific knowledge which is delivered to us as human beings that we, we it's not separate it's all the same thing, and that we have to work together, heart and head together. You know, this system, this thing that is the human creature, um, it has to work as a joined-up system or not at all. You know, we're back on the riverbank, aren't we? It all, it all goes together. And I would like to see much more love in the sense of the, the wideness of that word, which is also including compassion, which is about kindness, which is about recognising what it's like to be somebody else and not just you, which um, no, is love in the wider sense of wanting to protect this, this, this fragile, beautiful, extraordinary surprise of a planet uh, and the little, little persons running around and it will grow up to be big persons. We're, we've all got such a stake in this, and that is love. Um, and it shouldn't be pushed out, put aside, separate to all of these things. It's what we should bring to every conference, to every discussion, to every occasion. Who does this hurt? Um, who does this look after? And who does this benefit? Um, what will happen if we make this decision? And simply saying, oh, don't worry, like P&O, we'll just put all these people out of work, we'll do it by video conference, and then they'll be gone. You can't do that. Um, you know, my, Mrs. Winston, my religious mother, would have said that's a sin and a shame, and it is. And every person should be ashamed of what happened at P&O. That is a love problem. That is not perceiving what it's like to be those people on whom other lives depend. Every person you fire has a family. It's not one person who goes out of work. It's usually four people who suffer. Um, we're back to how do we want this society to be? So if love in the wider sense of the, world, of the word, is at the heart of what we do. And we bring in our prodigious intelligence and always keep that as the touchstone, as the place we return to. What have I done? What am I doing? Then we have a better guide, I think, than just relying on the fiendish cleverness that has brought us to a place now which is not looking very good. Well, let's end hopefully. Let's and end full hopefully. Of love. We and will. And we have a we have a final. It's a comment, not a question. Anyone who's an academic will get that in joke. Um, uh, but which has been thumbed up by twenty three other people um, from Alina. Could you please emphasise your thanks to Mrs. Winston at the end of the talk? This is an amazing talk, maybe the very best so far in this conference. So I think that does my thanks. Well, that's me. very decent. Of <laughs> <laughs> and I hope that we've been uh, networked effectively with you guys at home. Thank you for joining us. And please do stay on for the following talks this afternoon. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you.